Hello, my name is Lauren Williams, and I serve as the Deputy Director of the Strategic Technologies Program at CSIS. The Center for Strategic and International Studies, in partnership with the Cyber Solarium Commission 2.0 at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, recently launched the Commission on Cyber Force Generation. Today, we are excited to be joined by two of the commissioners, Chris Reed and Mark Montgomery, who will discuss the background of the Commission on Cyber Force Generation and why establishing a U.S. Cyber Force is imperative. Chris and Mark, we're so glad you could join us today, and we're excited to learn more about the Commission. Hey, thanks, Lauren. My name is Mark Montgomery, and I serve as the Senior Director of the Center on Cyber and Technology Innovation at FDD, where I also lead our Air and Missile Defense Program and direct the Cyber Solarium Commission 2.0 initiative. I spent 30 years in the U.S. Navy as a surface warfare officer, retiring as a Rear Admiral, and later served as Policy Director for the Senate Armed Services Committee under Senator John McCain. Today, my work focuses on advancing U.S. national and economic security through technology innovation and countering cyber threats to the United States and our allies. Chris Reed is the Chief of Staff for Elastic's U.S. Public Sector, where he helps coordinate efforts to support government customers. He also serves as a strategic advisor for OSEC, a New York-based cybersecurity firm. A retired Brigadier General with 36 years of service in the U.S. Army, Chris held assignments across infantry, special operations, and cyber units before retiring in 2024. The Commission is an effort by former senior military and civilian experts and practitioners to design a new military service aligned to the cyber domain. This would mean a service that serves the same functions for cyberspace as the Navy does for the maritime domain, or the Army's responsibility to fight and win the nation's land wars. This group has come together out of a shared recognition that the military's approach to cyberspace, first conceived nearly 15 years ago, has failed to generate the capabilities, you know, the warfighters and the tools that we require as a nation to project cyber power and defend America and its interests in the digital era. Despite the best efforts of innumerable individuals, we recognize that past attempts to make do with what we had ignore some basic and insurmountable truths about how the U.S. military is organized. Number one, our military services are organized and focused on a single warfighting domain. While every service flies aircraft, it's only the United States Air Force that is ultimately responsible for success or failure in air warfare. And number two, since the transformative reforms of, of the 1986 Goldwater-Nichols Act, there's a clear division of labor. The military services, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and Space Force, are responsible for organizing, training, and equipping military forces. This, these functions are also known as force generation. Combatant commands, otherwise known as COCOMs, are responsible for employment of the forces presented by the military services. And this function is known as force employment. The effect of these Goldwater Nichols reforms cannot be underestimated. Essentially overnight, the, US's mil the United States military command and control and its force de design was turned upside down. These reforms were the culmination of successive military failures, including the Mayaguez incident in Cambodia the disastrous hostage rescue attempt in Iran in 1980, as well as issues that emerged during the 1983 invasion of Grenada. And looking at this chart, you will see a quantitative comparison of the legislation around cyber issues versus those regarding special operations forces. If one accepts that each is a depiction of the relative congressional tension against an issue so significant that it required legislation to address, you see how much more congressional work has been put against cyberspace. As a former Senate staffer myself, I see two vastly different stories told through this graph. In the case of Special Operations Forces, there's been a necessity for legislation to address a manageable number of issues shown here in blue in that community. In the case of the military cyber capacity, I see a community that needs far too much help from the Congress to make it functional or believe it's operating well. That, Chris, is what you see in gold. Much like the emergence of the air domain in the early 20th century and the space domain in the late 20th and first decades of the 21st century, the military services are slow to appreciate or capitalize on the revolutionary potential of a new warfighting domain. You know, after a decade and a half of insistence that the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps could collectively manage the demands of this new domain, the country in 2025 finds itself struggling to keep pace with adversaries like China, which have moved far faster and with more resources and more political commitment. In building the construct, 
utilized today. The Department of Defense essentially ignored the core organizing principles laid out earlier. Rather than accept that the department and the services have never successfully adapted to a new warfighting domain without externally imposed structural change, the Pentagon projected a confidence in being able to divide the responsibility for the new domain between Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps. Unfortunately, our historical record after 15 years has proven that our best efforts have left us ill-prepared for 21st century conflict with adversaries attacking U.S. interests in cyberspace on a daily basis. Much as the advent of aviation and access to the air domain completely transformed the character of war in the other warfighting domains of the day, namely land and sea, access to the space and cyber domains are having similarly groundbreaking effects now. But we can only exploit those effects to our national advantage when our military services and our institutions are organized to achieve outcomes in those domains. Look, last year, Dr. Erica Lonergan and I released the first report on the notion of a dedicated cyber force which leveraged the views and opinions of both military and civilian cyber operators. Having heard from nearly 100 individuals from senior enlisted leaders to general and flag officers and senior executive civilians. The response was unequivocal. So of the nearly 100 responses to the question, what is wrong today and what would it take to fix it? 100% replied with a view that the force generation model wasn't working and that a cyber force may be necessary. Respondents cited a multitude of factors that informed their judgment, including real world operational failures, institutional shortfalls, training deficiencies, gaps in tactics, techniques and procedures, and acquisition errors. The interviewees were unequivocal in their belief that the cyber force generation process was broken across every military service. In my time at Cyber Command, culminating in 2022, I was the lead for the commander in securing additional budget, manpower, and Title X authorities he required to try to fix the force generation issues. The thinking at the time was to emulate other combatant commands' success in employing forces from the services specifically designed to dominate in their respective warfighting domains, air, land, and sea. While securing additional resources was a necessary first step in the process for Cyber Command, it fell far short of what was needed in order to organize and field a force capable of fighting and winning in the cyberspace domain. Hey Chris, you know, there's a famous Ro Roman proverb that says, if you want peace, prepare for war. And look, I speak for myself, for Chris, and all the other commissioners and individuals involved in this effort when I say, thank you for watching this explainer, and thank you for your continued interest in this necessary next revolution in American military affairs. Thank you.